10 Canadians have traveled to space, and one of them is way up there right now. And lift off. This past December, David St. Jacques was sent on a mission to the International Space Station. Hello, Canada. He's conducting scientific experiments, testing new technologies, and might even go on a spacewalk from here on Earth. Many of us wonder just what it's like to be in space. Well, who would know better than Dave Williams? He's been up there twice, a proud Canadian, and even still a sort of space ambassador. Huge congratulations to you and the rest of the crew. Just this week, he was at a school in Saskatoon helping students ask questions to David St. Jacques on the space station. Keep up the fantastic work. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for being an inspiration to me when I was a young man and a student. He's also a kind of space gatekeeper. He has a hand in deciding who gets to soar the stars. Hey, Dave. Great to see you again. Nice to see you again. So, I met up with Dave Williams earlier this week at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. What was that like, first of all, just having that chance to speak with David St. Jean? It was fantastic. I was as excited as, as the kids were. You know, it's really nice when you participate in the selection of an astronaut and watch them go through their career. It's waited 10 years to be able to go into space. And then to see David in space thriving, it was just fantastic. Was there something about, about what he said or how he looked that, that struck you in particular? I love the energy that he has on board the space station. His smile is incredible. You could see that right at the moment they opened the hatch and came across on board the International Space station. He's got a huge Canadian flag on his uh, uniform and a big smile on his face. You knew it was going to be a great mission. You did two missions in space, one in 07, the other in, in 98. Yes. You were part of the selection committee, you know, before which David St. Jacques had to appear and, and that got him off to the races. I mean, can, can you tell me about that? It was an incredibly talented group of Canadians, as you can imagine. It was very difficult selecting the final two, but uh, both candidates brought incredible charisma, incredible passion about space exploration, and done an amazing job in their Astronaut Canada training, and then throughout their career as astronauts so far. All right, ready? Okay, push. All right, pull. You mentioned the word charisma. And David St. Jacques, undeniably a strong communicator. How big of a factor was that when it came to choosing or deciding whether or not he ought to have that chance to, to blast off into outer space? It is really important. Communication is one of the fundamental skills that we look for in astronauts. It's important to be a scientist. It's important to be a team player. We also have to be able to communicate the reality of being in space, what it means to be in space, why it's so important for Canada to remain a major spacefaring nation, and then also what the Earth is really like looking at it from space. And what about the other sort of, I mean, everyday interactions? I mean, just, just meeting people and their, and their ability to, to have a conversation and to, to excite people. So from a selection perspective, we're interested in how the candidates interact with everyone, whether it's the receptionist at the hotel that they're staying at or the individual that they speak on the phone with at the Canadian Space Agency. From a committee perspective, we try and find out all this information. Wow, really? Yeah. The emphasis on communicating the goals of the space program. I wonder, does that, does that speak to what I think is one of the great challenges of the space program? And that is the bottom line. Right? I mean, space exploration, it, it ain't cheap. And, and it feels like you, you constantly have to, to convince people that it's worth the money. I mean, is that part of the thinking? That is part of the thinking, and we do have to be able to articulate why we're doing this. You know, if you look at the cost of space exploration, it's huge. However, the economic opportunity associated with space exploration is even larger. Right now, the global space program represents roughly a $350 billion industry, of which our share is roughly about five, five and a half billion dollars. Over the next 20 years, that will grow to in excess of one trillion dollars. So not only is space exploration about exploration, it's about innovation, it's about developing new technology. And so let me, let me put you on the spot a little bit. I mean, what, what is an example of something in particular with the mission, with the experiments that David St. Jacques might be running up on the International Space Station that you think holds enough promise that, that you know, us Earthlings should be excited about it? Yeah. What David's doing in space is evaluating a whole host of different experiments and things, but one of which is very, very exciting. It's virtual medical care. 
wearing a specifically designed t-shirt that has physiologic sensors built into the t-shirt that record various bits of data from his body and can send that information down to mission control. Why is that important for healthcare on earth? That's the future of healthcare on earth. We're evolving from hospital based, geographically based healthcare into virtual clinical care, hospitals without walls, where we'll have elderly patients at home with an array of sensors either on their body, potentially inside their body that then take that information and send it wirelessly over the internet in a confidential manner so that it can be screened by clinicians to enable us to keep people at home and care for them in that environment. But I guess the question is, why do you have to do that in space? I mean, couldn't you test all these technologies down here? Oh, you can certainly test all the technologies down here. The requirements of space are what drive the development of these new technologies. It started in the 60s with critical care monitoring technology. That really didn't exist in hospitals until the Apollo program developed a requirement to record the heart rate of astronauts when they were out doing spacewalks. So all of a sudden the technology gets driven in space, applied on Earth, perfected on Earth, taken back to space, and the continuity of the technology development cycle continues. If we zoom out a little bit and, and think of the the bigger picture. There's all kinds of talk about a plan B for Earth uh, or a planet B uh, as, as the case may be, you know, thinking of Mars in particular. There are a number of, of let's call them aspirational thinkers. I mean, think of Stephen Hawking, think of Elon Musk, who, who believe that the, the survival of our species, I mean, in, in the way that, you know, space travel may be an escape hatch of sorts, that our survival depends on colonizing other worlds. Do you subscribe to that? I think that there's a strong argument to be made that that's an aspect of exploring space. I look at it fundamentally from a, an exploration perspective and hope that we're going to be able to protect our home planet and be able to thrive for millennia to come on our home planet. But we don't know. There could be some terrestrial imperative, some biological imperative that the human species has to leave Earth and go elsewhere in our solar system, in which case getting to Mars may take on a totally different significance. I wonder if, if there is an inherent danger in, in thinking of space exploration in that vein as being a way out in case we muck up this planet a little too much. Hey, there's always, there's always Mars. You know, I think it's important to think about what we're doing right now to the Earth and the impact that we, the human species, have had on our own planet. When we're in space, the greatest single message shared by every astronaut is the importance of taking care of our home planet. People would say, what planet do you want to live on in the solar system? I want to live on the Earth. It's the best planet in the solar system. And notwithstanding the fact that, sure, we can send humans to Mars and we'll do that in the next 50 to 100 years, but it's going to take a lot of technological change on the surface of Mars to enable us to live and thrive on that planet the same way we do on Earth. And, and there are other international aspirations beyond Mars, of course, right? I mean, we've, we've seen India with its grand plan to sort of breach the final frontier. We have China, which recently successfully made a, a touchdown on the far side of the moon. What do you think of all that? Are, are we seeing a new space race? I think we're seeing a new frontier that's opening up. There's absolutely no question. When you look at the economic forecast for the global space market, that growth is based on the continued and expanded exploration of space. I've written a series of kids books. My fourth kids book with Lord Anna talks about destination space, living on other planets in the solar system. Some reviewers said, no, no, that's science fiction. It's never going to happen. But to your point, I think it will happen. Over the course of the next 50 to 100 years of human space exploration, yes, we're going to see humans on Mars, we're going to see humans going farther into space. Is that exploration though largely cooperative or is it competitive? I think we're going to see whether that exploration will be cooperative or competitive. The greatest lesson of the International Space Station is the lesson of international collaboration and that we have countries from all over the world with individuals that speak totally different languages, developing technology in totally different ways, bringing it together successfully for the first time in space. That's a remarkable story of collaboration. And as we look to going back to the moon and ultimately on to Mars, the initial discussions are collaborative discussions, not necessarily competitive discussions. And yet you have the case of, of China, right? A global superpower that seems to be content on 
charting its own course, yes. doing its own thing. And in the beginning of the space program, that's the way it was as well. We had two major nations, the United States and Russia, exploring space on their own. And then they realized that there's an opportunity to come together in 1976 with the Apollo-Soyuz test project. So I think nations develop their own capability, and as they go forward and explore space, then they begin to recognize the opportunity to do it collaboratively and to leverage off each other's expertise. Let me ask you one last question. What is the great hope, so to speak, in terms of what, what fruit these forays into space might ultimately bear? I mean, is, is, it, is it wealth and, and resources? Is it the survival of our species? Is it, is it glory and, and inspiration? Or, or is it you know, just another battlefield for, for humans to scrap it out on? You know, I think if we were to sum up the great hope of space exploration, we go to space in the hope that we can explore space, but more importantly, further understand ourselves and the world that we live in, and bring that planetary perspective of space back home to help us with fundamental issues here on Earth. And that's one of the greatest gifts that all astronauts experience when we're in space, is a desire to come back, share the experience with others, and help others develop a more planetary global perspective. Dave Williams, very nice to speak with you. Real pleasure, thanks.